Hello, it's Don Michelle from Boho Tiro, and today I am doing a collaboration with my good friend Lisa Pepez, and we are going to be sharing with you how we each approach a Celtic cross reading. So jumping into this topic, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my history with the Celtic cross, and then I'm going to share with you my variation of the Celtic cross and to talk about a couple of tips that I have for working with the Celtic cross on the whole. So let's go ahead and jump in to my variation on the Celtic cross. So we're going to take a look at a couple of different versions of the Celtic cross, a couple of different um, variations, I should say, on the Celtic cross from some different reference guides, as well as some guidebooks. And then I'm going to show you how I've kind of come around to working with this particular layout and this particular spread. So the first book that we're going to take a look at is 78 Degrees of Wisdom by Rachel Pollock. Um, this was the first tarot book I ever read, like the first official tarot book I re ever read that wasn't a guidebook. I had an, a much older edition. This is the revised edition. So this was the first time that I really experienced a Celtic cross and kind of looked at how to build one was through this reference guide. So this is kind of my foundational understanding of what a Celtic cross is is. So as Rachel Pollock says in her book, over the years this pattern has proved the most popular. The cross derives its name from its shape, a cross of equal arms, one card on each side of the center with four cards lined up as a staff beside it. As we might expect, commentators disagree on the meanings of particular positions and how to describe them. Some, such as Waite and Eden Gray, provide a sort of ritual for the reader to pronounce while laying out the cards of this covers him or this lies beneath him. Others prefer more conventional phraseology. It does not matter which system we use as long as we remain constant. So in Rachel Pollock's 10 card um, Celtic cross pattern, we have the traditional kind of cross in the center with the staff running along the side. This is the traditional layout that we often see. Um, you'll see when I do it, I do just a slight variation over here. It doesn't really matter how you lay the cards in terms of that. What we're really looking at is kind of the positions. So in her Celtic cross, position one is the center. Position two is what is crossing. So this is often what is crossing or covering you. Position three is kind of the basis or the foundation. Position four is the recent past. Position five is possible outcomes. Six is the new future. Seven is the self. Eight is the environment. Nine is hopes and fears. And 10 is outcome. So that is the way that um, Rachel Pollock approaches a Celtic cross. And you will see as we go through a couple of different variations that the positions, although they may move slightly, the base layout of the Celtic cross remains the same. So let's take a look at a couple of others. So in Benabel Wen's Holistic Tarot, she provides us with a couple of different variations variations on the Celtic cross. So in this book, we have the Celtic cross layout following the gray, as both her and Rachel Pollock have referenced. So in this particular Celtic cross, we have in position one, the heart of the matter, what covers the seeker in the present. In position two, which would actually be the considered the crossing card in most um, layouts, we have the challenges or the obstacles. So what blocks the seeker? Um, three and four are both listed as past influence cards. Five is lessons not yet learned. Um, six is the most probable outcome. Seven is again an, a most probable outcome. Eight is a seeker's future self. Nine is a shadow. And 10 is positive hopes and aspirations if negative seeker's fears. That to me, that's confusing. <laughs> And I've been reading tarot for a while. So in Waits um, interpretation, you'll see that it's fairly similar. So here we have position one is the heart of the matter. Position two is the challenges or obstacles. Position three, which is actually on top here, is the foundation or roots. Four which is down below here, is the past influences. Five is the aspirations or speculation. Six is the immediate future. Seven is the seeker's view of self. Eight is the seeker and environment. Nine is the hopes and fears. And 10 is the probable outcome. So you can see here that we still have basically the same information that we're trying to get at. It's just the positions may vary. So in weights, we have the, um, in card three, the foundation and roots up here. Uh, in 
grays, card three is actually down below, which is the past influences. Um, the probable outcome in weights is card 10, whereas the most probable outcome in um, grays is position uh, six or seven. The seeker's view of self is position seven in weights and in grays, it's position eight. So when you're looking across all these different variations, like this can get super confusing, but you can see that there's several different ways and variations that we can arrange these cards to get at this same information. So we can also find the Celtic cross listed in our modern tarot guidebooks as well. So here we have the Celtic cross from the everyday witch. And you can see that this one is a little bit of a modified version because rather than having cards one and two being placed on top of each other, um, they are spread next to each other. So we have card one is represents the querent, the general environment and the life at the time of the reading. Question two is the situation or issue. Or card three is the foundation. Four is what's passing out of influence. Um, card five is the influences from the outside. Six is the first future card. Then we have seven is how you see yourself. Eight is how others see you. Card nine is your hopes and fears and 10 is your future. Again, still kind of that similar information being gathered, but you know, presented in a kind of its own little way. So when I first started working with the Celtic Cross, this was primarily the Celtic Cross version that I worked with, which is Rachel Pollock's. I have used others that I found in other guidebooks or other online resources or other reference materials such as this one. And that has been the primary way that I worked with the Celtic Cross starting out. To be perfectly honest, a lot of the language that people used for their positions in their Celtic Cross, I often found quite confusing. But I would go ahead and use this spread, right? Because this was the traditional tarot spread. This was the one that everybody used. And so I figured it must be the best, right? So then when I kind of went off on my own, kind of developing my own language with the tarot, I ended up ditching the Celtic cross altogether because for the most part, I just thought, it's too complicated, it's too convoluted, there are too many variations on it and I don't really understand how I'm supposed to make use of this in any real way. I didn't really understand the information that I was getting and the cards in the positions and the messages that I was supposed to be getting weren't really working for me. So really, out of sheer frustration, I stopped using the Celtic cross probably 10 years ago and I really did didn't think about it a whole lot since then because I primarily made my own spreads or I followed other spreads online. So like there's even full books out there. I like have a few on my website of different spreads that you can do. So I was like, I really don't need the Celtic cross. You know, I have other spreads that work just, just as well, if not actually better for me, that makes sense to me. And it wasn't until I really kind of started doing this process of going back to basics um, to try and refamiliarize myself with my foundational knowledge because I learned tarot quite a while ago, like a long time ago. <laughs> um, so my traditional knowledge you know, it's still there and I've layered and layered and layered and layered and layered over it over the, you know, past couple of decades. But it's really nice to, I think, kind of go back to that kind of basics because I'm looking at it now through fresh eyes because I'm looking at it now with all of these years of tarot knowledge that I've gathered. And so I thought, well, while I'm looking at all of this, let me go back and look at that dang Celtic cross because it is in so many books. And it is the one that we like pretty much all have heard of, right? We may not know it, we may not use it, but we've probably heard of it. So I decided to kind of go back and do some research on the Celtic cross to kind of look at some different ways of, of working with it, some different variations. And of course, like most things in my tarot practice, what I found ended up working better for me was to actually kind of take all of those reference materials. I went through a bunch of my books. I went on a search online and I compiled a bunch of different versions of the Celtic cross. And then I stopped and kind of 
analyzed what each of those positions meant across multiple spreads. So I'm going to share with you the Celtic cross or the version of the Celtic cross that I have created so that perhaps you can use that as a jumping off point to maybe diving deep into the Celtic cross or developing your own. So let's go ahead and take a look at how I lay a Celtic cross. So the first card I lay down goes in the center here, and this is what I call the heart of the situation. This is the kind of focal point. This is what is going on. Um, it is important to note that I generally have a very specific question or situation that I am doing a reading about when I come to the Celtic Cross. I, it's not a spread that I use for like a what do I need to know today. It really is a spread that I come to when I need very specific information about a situation situation or a question that I have. So as I'm laying this first heart of the matter card, I am really focused in on the question that I am asking or the situation that I am reading about. Card number two, I do lay down across the card, but I see this as the influence card. So unlike other spreads where maybe they call it the challenge card or what's crossing you, what's kind of blocking you, I see this as the influence card. It's neither positive or negative. That kind of depends on what card comes up, what situation we're looking at, but it is giving us some indication of what might be influencing the current situation, good, bad, or otherwise. Card number three is the above card. So this is kind of what is on your mind in regards to this situation. This is what you consciously already know about the situation. Card number four then comes down here for below. And this is kind of the foundation, the root, kind of what's going on beneath the surface of all this. Um, it's maybe what's not quite known yet, right? It hasn't come to light as we see here in the above card. So card number five brings in the behind. So this is kind of what would be considered our sort of past, where this is what is coming to an end. So out of this, what's going on here in the current situation, this about the current situation is going to be ending. So on the opposite side of that, we have card number six, and this could kind of be considered the future card. I call it the before card. So this is where you're heading is what lies before you. So we have what is above you in regards to the situation, what's beneath you or the foundation of the situation. We have what is in the past or behind you that you're going to be leaving behind that is going to come to an end as a result of this this question or situation and we have what still lies before you so kind of where you're headed in regards to this current situation now for me this little cross here really um, hones in on what is going on in relation to this situation we can see that the cards literally create a circle around the heart of the matter so we have what what we know what we don't know what we're leaving behind and what we're going into you can also see this in a really basic sense of this is the heart of the matter this is what's influencing it this is what is in the conscious mind the subconscious mind what's in the past and what is in the present and these two cards um, on either side are often considered like the near future and then the near past so these are recent things going on so it really is kind of a what's going on in the here and now we're not really worried about what happened 10 years ago. This is really about the here and now. And I like that this kind of creates this foundational energy for the reading. This helps me get really clear about what is going on in the current situation or in regards to the question that I have asked. So the cards that run along this side, which kind of create, I think they call that the staff of the reading. We have another four cards and these four cards for me kind of show what do I do about it? And that's what it what I really love about this particular spread. So card number seven, and you'll see that I, I kind of lay them sideways. You can certainly stack them up traditional one on top of the other. I like to lay them sideways. That also gives me a visual indication that while it is a linear progress going from card seven to card 10, as we'll see, that it's not 
rigid. The kind of angled layout of the cards kind of tells me that like it's in motion because anything that I do to affect this situation can affect the outcome of the cards or affect the outcome of the situation as a whole. So if I totally detour and do something totally off the wall in regards to this situation, then these cards are no longer going to apply because now I've changed the situation, right? So it just is a visual reminder to me that it's not necessarily a linear path. Things can change, things can shift. It is always in flux and in flow in terms of what's going on and how I respond to each situation or each thing that comes up in relation to the situation or this question. So card number seven is the lesson. And this is what I'm going to learn from this situation. This is what this situation, good or bad, is going to be teaching me. And so that is represented here in card number seven. Card number eight here is the path. This is kind of the journey or the progress. So this is where I'm at currently in my dealings with this situation. So I have the lesson I'm gonna learn, the path I am currently on, which is gonna kind of tell me if I keep on this path, if I keep going this way, this is the outcome of what's gonna come out. So here we have card number nine, which is the advice. And I love this card. It's called a lot of different things and a lot of different um, versions of the Celtic cross. I call it the advice card because to me, this is the card that tells me, what do I do? What do I do about it? This to me is the most important card, but in order to understand this card, I have to have built all of this foundational knowledge and understanding in order to understand what this card's gonna mean for me. So this is the advice card. It kind of tells me, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? And then card number 10 is our outcome card. This is what will manifest if I continue to follow along in this little trajectory that I have here. So if I learn this lesson, if I continue on this path, if I take this advice, this is the outcome that I'm going to come to in regards to this situation. So this is a really fun spread to do, um, but it's also a really enlightening spread. And until I broke it down in this particular way, I didn't really get the Celtic cross. Like I got it, right? I understood it, but it didn't ever really connect for me because the positions didn't really make sense. So now that I've kind of gone over the positions, let's go ahead and flip the cards around and I'll talk about how I actually read each one individually and then we'll read them together as a whole. Now, it is important to note that I do not have a specific question or situation in mind because I'm doing kind of like a tutorial here. So I don't know if this reading is gonna make any sense, but I can at least share with you what each position is, how I would read it and how I work with the cards individually. So the first thing that I do is I kind of take this little guy and I stick it over here. <laughs> and I do have a card that I sometimes throw in this position and I'll show you that here at the end. Uh, so the first thing that I do is I flip over the first card and this is the heart of the situation. So here I have the Kermit. So I would think about this card the heart of the situation, this is the heart of the matter. So I would think about what was this spread about? What was the question that I came to? How does that relate to the hermit? I would journal that, I would write that down. So let's go ahead and just pull out a piece of paper and I'm gonna show you, I would write card one, which is the heart, is the hermit, and I would think about what does the hermit mean in relation to this reading? Maybe it's telling me that I'm being too solitary right now. Maybe it's telling me that I need to seek inner um, enlightenment. Uh, again, because I don't have a particular you know, thought, question, or situation in mind, I couldn't really tell you, but I'm just trying to kind of show you basically how I would like write this down. So I'd kind of take a little, little time to think about what does the hermit mean in relation to this question? How does the hermit represent the heart of the situation, the heart of the matter? So I'd write that down. I think about that. This is definitely not a fast reading. This is something that I that I take a lot of time to really think about and to work through card by card and then as a reading as a whole. 
So now I'm going to pull this card back over here. And remember, this was card number two, our influence card. And although we turn it sideways to me, it doesn't really matter what which way it's laying. So here we have the card of judgment, and that's what's influencing our hermit energy here. So we have the hermit as the heart of the matter, and what's influencing it is judgment. So then again, I would come to my pad of paper here, my journal, and I would write down two, which is the influence, and we got judgment. Now, of course, there's a whole load of information I could get just from these two cards telling me what's currently going on in regards to the situation. We're in the hermit, and we are being influenced by judgment. Both being two major arcana cards, that could speak to really big energies going on in our lives. So I would write down a little bit about what does what does judgment mean in relation to the hermit being the situation? How can judgment be influencing the hermit here? So I would think about that. I would take some time to journal about that. Um, again, this is not a fast process for me and therefore not a reading I do very often unless I really have a particular situation or a question that I really need to dive into and I really need um, some good advice about. So card three, we're at above. So what's going on in the mind? We have the 10 of wands. So maybe what's going on in the mind based on the artwork and the RWS, maybe we're feeling some burden. We know that this is a, is a heavy situation. Again, we have major arcana cards here, speaks to kind of big life energies. And in our mind, we kind of know that this is weighing heavily upon us, right? But this tells me that we are consciously aware of the weight that this situation is creating um, over our lives and over what's going on currently. So that's what's going on in the conscious realm. That's what we're aware of, what we know, what's on our mind. So then we have what's going on below. So what's the foundation here? Um, we have the five of cups. So maybe the foundation here is kind of some emotional upheaval. So I would take this and I would look at it. What kind of emotional energies am I feeling about this situation? Um, this five of cups may be telling me that I'm, I'm not as okay with the situation as maybe I think I am. And so I would take some time and I would think about that. I would journal about that. How does this card down here kind of create the foundation or the root of what's going on here? And I like this card being down at the bottom. I know it's moved around in other um, versions of the Celtic cross, but I really like it being down at the bottom here. It visually shows that these are, these are where things are moving from. It is the underneath. It is the foundation, like visually the foundation of the reading. So then we have um, card five, which is our behind. So this is what's behind us, uh, what we're moving away from. So we have that king of wands there. And then in card six, we have what is uh, before us. So what we are moving into. Again, we have another major arcana card. So we're looking at, okay, we kind of know what's going on above and below. So what we're aware of, maybe what we're not so aware of, what we need to bring into awareness. Um, what we're leaving behind over here as we move away from whatever is going on in the past here into this current situation and what we are going to be moving into as we work through all of this. We're going to be moving into that justice card. And so this gives us kind of a really good overview of the situation. Here's where we're at. Here's what's going on. Here's what we're aware of. Here's what we're not aware of, or maybe we need to bring into awareness because this is the foundation of the heart of the matter. This is what's influencing us currently, what we need to be leaving behind, what we're going to be working toward. And we can get all of this in this one little five card reading. So then we can come over here to our second line of our reading and we can look at, okay, what do we need to do about this now? So again, I would take these cards individually now that I've spent some time with each of these cards by themselves in relation to their position and then looking at them as a whole. So this reading is its own little reading. Then I come over here to this reading and I'm gonna add this as another layer. So card number seven is going to be our lesson. What are we going to learn from this whole situation? And we have the three of swords here. So depending on how you read, the three of swords is going to depend on how you see that particular card. This is the lesson that we're going to be learning. 
So card number eight is the path. And here we have the Ace of Wands. So this is where we currently are on this progression and where we're going to the path that we are following. So we have the Ace of Wands. So we have kind of this new growth, maybe following a new passion that is going to come out of all of this because we're at an Ace. So we're kind of at that potential, that beginning. So maybe this is going to bring a new beginning. So then we have our card nine, which is our advice card. And here we have our King of Cups. Really interesting to have a court card because again, as it depends on how you read the court cards as to what to this card may mean um, to you in particular. Um, this card to me says that, you know, the King of Cups being kind of the, the master of the suit of emotion tells me that the advice for me would be to kind of get control of what's going on here right? To, to kind of master that so that we can move forward. So then we have a card 10, which is our outcome card. And here we have the King of Swords. So depending on how you read those court cards, I see the King of Swords as kind of being the, the mastery of the suit of the mind. And so again, this is telling me that kind of once I've created this, dealt with this, I've learned this lesson, I've continued on this path, I've taken this advice, where I'm going to get to is this really clear understanding of what is going on. So then I would kind of just take a look at the reading as a whole now that I have all the cards flipped over and see if any other things pop up. I mean, I could definitely look to the fact that there's three major arcana sitting right here in this little triad. I've got multiple kings. That's definitely something to look at um, and I can also you know kind of read this maybe as a whole so this is a situation and then you know here's what I got to do about it all and of course I would you know spend some time really looking through this journaling about it looking at each card in position in their positions and how they kind of go as a whole so a couple of things that I found to be really really helpful in working with a Celtic cross um, is to for one, reframe the positions if they don't work for you. So if you come across a Celtic cross in a book and you're like, that position doesn't make any sense to me. Like for me, there's a couple of spreads that I came across where the foundational energy card was represented up here in this card. To me, that doesn't visually make sense because it's above. It's not below. And to me, when I'm thinking of foundational energy, I'm looking at what's below it, right? What's beneath the surface. So when I'm creating my own Celtic cross or my own version of it, I'm putting the visually what things make sense to me as I'm laying the cards out. To me, it makes sense to have the heart of the matter card in the middle. It makes sense to have the influence card over the top of the heart of the matter card because that's what's influencing, directly influencing the heart of the matter. It makes sense to have the um, kind of above, to be physically above the heart of the matter and the below or the root or the foundation to be directly beneath it. It makes sense to me visually for the past to be on the left side as in this is what we're leaving behind and the future to be on the right side. That's just how it makes sense to me. So visually, I lay the cards down that way because visually I can look at this and immediately draw correlations between this is what's going on above, below, past, and future because that to me in a visual sense you know, makes sense to me. So one of the things that I found to be really helpful is if you find a Celtic cross version and you're like, I like that position, but I don't like where it's physically laid in the spread, just move it. <laughs> like there is no rule that says you can't rewrite a Celtic cross. Everybody's done it. It's okay. Go ahead and do it. Um, the other thing was this side of the the staff didn't make sense for me in a lot of the different variations of the Celtic cross. So let's go back to Rachel Pollock's. So in Rachel Pollock's card seven, here is the self. So it says the card on the bottom of the staff is called the self and refers not to the whole person, but to some way the person is contributing to the situation. That's what that card means in, in Rachel Pollock's version of the Celtic cross. So to me, that does, like this is all self to me. So um, this is all what's what's going on in the situation, and I already see self in here. So I didn't need 
a particular card to represent self or how I'm influencing the situation because I think that every card shows an aspect of self and how I'm influencing the situation. What I liked and I saw in a, some variation and I couldn't tell you which one it was now at this point, um, but there was a position for lesson learned. I liked that position. I thought that made sense in terms of once we kind of uh, figure out what's going on here. We can figure out what lesson is going to come out of that. And I like it being at the bottom over here because it kind of shows me that if I, if I do this, this is kind of what's going to come out of that. And then other things are going to come out of that, right? If that makes sense. So looking at visually, that's how I visually understood what that position means. So in Rachel's um, Celtic Cross, we had position eight is the environment. And I've often seen this card is how others see you. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be honest. When it comes to a situation, um, if I'm using a reading because I read for myself, like entirely for myself. So when I'm looking at a situation or reading like this, there's it's because there's some aspect of myself or my life that I'm trying to figure out. It doesn't really have anything to do with anybody else. So having a card to represent how other people see me, dude, I don't care. Like, I know that sounds terrible, but how other people see me does not influence my behavior because I will act in a way that is authentic to me and in a way that feels in alignment with my current situation or what I need to do whether or not people approve of that or what they think of it does not register on my radar in terms of how I will, you know, work on my own personal self growth, right? Um, so I took that out because that doesn't resonate with how I work with the tarot, nor does it resonate with how I authentically am in the world. And I replaced that with, again, another position that I had seen in another spread, although not necessarily in this literal position um, of card eight. I replaced that with the path. This is where I am. This is where I'm going because that's kind of like, what do I need to know after I know what lesson I need to learn? I need to know where I, where I need to go from here. This is the path that I need to follow to get to this outcome card. And again, that that is what makes sense for me and the way that I work with tarot. So I just changed it to fit my own own my own version my own interpretation card nine I've seen as many different things Rachel Pollock has it as your hopes and fears um, I've seen that come up in a lot of different variations of the Celtic cross and again that's another one that I removed from the situation because I don't really want hope or fear to determine a decision that I make um, I want to make decisions not because I'm just hoping for a good outcome, but because I'm going to put things into motion to ensure a good outcome. And I certainly don't want fears to influence how I approach a situation. I don't want a fear to ever hold me back. I don't want a fear to keep me from moving forward. It's another reason why I changed this from being a challenge or an obstacle card to just an influence. Because in my experience, any one of these cards in any situation could represent a hope or a fear. You know, I could fear this Ten of Wands energy. I could hope for this justice card, right? Any one of these cards can relate to that particular idea of my hopes and my fears. So I see that that is kind of represented throughout the reading. I don't need a specific position for it. So again, I changed that to advise. Um, what can I do about it, right? That's kind of the main reason why we do a reading. Um, I want to know what to do about it. So what do I do moving forward, knowing what I know here, if I put this into action, if I keep following this process, you know, what do I need to know in order to get to that final outcome card? And again, the outcome card at number 10 is quite common. Most um, Celtic crosses have an outcome card. Um, it's somewhere in the position. It is often in position 10 because it's often the final card in the reading. And that is kind of like, if you stay on the trajectory that you're on, 
and if you actually do the things that you need to do, this is a possible outcome. Now, of course, I don't really read tarot predictively most of the time, and I understand that um, the cards do not ever make anything happen for me. I have to actually put things into motion. I have to do things. I have to have the intention. I have to put the effort in in order for there to ever be an outcome. It's not going to magically happen just because I laid these cards down and I got this King of Swords. Um, this King of Swords is not going to happen for me without me making it happen. This is maybe the outcome that I need to be seeking. It's not so much predictive. It's not telling me that if I do all of this, then I will for sure be, you know, embodying the King of Swords or that I will manifest the King of Swords energy. That's just one of the energies or the, um, possible outcomes that might come from this situation is that I might walk away from this situation with a clearer understanding of what is going on. I might feel more secure in the decisions that I have made. Context is hugely important in the way that I read tarot and I am going to do a totally separate video on it because all of this could change based on the question that I'm asking the con in the context of the reading. So that's hugely important and it's really hard to do like a sample reading without a particular question in mind and have the cards make any sort of sense. But um, the main point of this video was to show you how I work through a Celtic cross and to show you how I've changed it to suit my own understandings. Um, for me to have a, a card of self doesn't make any sense because I read for myself. So every card is in a sense for self. It's an aspect of self. Um, to have a card that relates to what other people think of me doesn't really apply to the way that I read tarot because I don't make my decisions based on what other people think of me. Um, you know, to have a, a card that represents hope and fears doesn't really work for me because I look at every card as, as it could be potentially be an aspect of a hope or a fear. And I don't need a dedicated position for that because there are hopes and fears that will um, emerge out of the rest of the reading. So also in a quick quick wrap up to this, um, occasionally I will lay an additional card down um, from kind of like an extra card as a what deeper lesson do I need to learn? So this is kind of like this is the situation, this is what's going on and to get to this outcome. But this is the, the situation kind of on the whole. And so sometimes I will pull a, an extra card for a what deeper lesson do I need to learn? And I've got the four of pentacles and that one I just kind of lay over here. So that would be the deeper lesson that this whole experience here is going to teach us. And that's a kind of an optional card. Sometimes I lay it down, sometimes I don't. Again, it really depends on the situation um, and on the, the reading that I'm doing. The, the context um, the um, focus of the reading. So just a couple of notes or takeaways that I found to be really helpful in working with the Celtic Cross is, like I said, change anything that doesn't work for you. The Celtic Cross is not written in stone. It is a guideline. It's spread to help you create a reading. And if there are positions that don't work for you, feel free to change them to something that does. Just kind of tweaking those individual positions to make sense to you and the, the type of reading that you're doing in the moment. Moment, um, can be really helpful. Um, I've also found that laying cards face down um, can be, and just dealing with them one at a time, as you saw me do, can be quite helpful with not just this reading, but any larger reading. But with the Celtic cross, because each element really does help to create a fuller understanding and a fuller picture of the reading as a whole. I find that like if we just lay them all down here to start with, like to just lay them all down and then this this is like a lot. And I think this is a lot of times what we find really overwhelming because we're we've laid all this down and we're looking at this going, oh my goodness, there's so much going on here and I don't even know where to begin. But if we deal with them one card at a time, we can kind of get a good idea and understanding of that card and that in that position before we move on to the next one. So before I move on to the what's influencing this situation, I really want to look at the page of wands in terms of 
how does that represent the heart of the situation? And I won't move on to the next card until I have a good understanding of what I think this card means. Now that may change slightly after I get all of these cards flipped over, but for right now, I kind of just take them one at a time. Once I get that kind of heart of the matter locked down, I kind of think I know what it's talking about, then I can look at what's influencing it. Once I really have a good understanding of this little cross here, I can look at, you know, what's going on above it and then kind of take it one at a time. And for me, that's really helpful in helping me to really dive deep and to digest each card of the reading and take them one at a time in relation to their positions. So I do find it really helpful to just do them one at a time and to really kind of just focus in on each card in its position and figure out what that means before I move on to the next. And then again, once I get all of these cards flipped over, um, I really want to take some time to focus in on this situation and get a good understanding of it before I move on to these cards over here. And so I find that kind of breaking it down into steps like that can be really helpful. Um, definitely rephrasing positions if they don't make sense to you if that position of self doesn't make sense to you change it to something that does like I said there's there's no written in stone way to do a Celtic cross everybody has a different variation and you are welcome to create your own um, for one that resonates with you and how you read the cards and what makes sense to you in your practice and in your particular situation. Sometimes I change the positions based on the situation that I'm reading on too. Um, I think that that's totally okay to do. I may be the only one that will ever say that, but I'm all for making it work for you. So feel free to change it up. Uh, rewrite the Celtic cross if you need to. There's nobody that is going to come along and tell you you can't. And if they do, well, Tell them too bad. It's my Celtic cross. I'll do it the way I want to. So I found that to be really, really helpful. I've also found it to be hugely helpful to, you know, write things down to kind of keep a running record as I'm going through the reading and then to kind of do a, a kind of a long free write session afterwards about what the whole the reading of the whole was trying to tell me. Um, I find that to be really, really helpful as well. So I hope that you enjoyed this look at my personal variation on the Celtic cross and how I go about reading one and making it work for me. So let's pop on over to Lisa's channel for a look at how she does the Celtic cross. You will find a link for that video in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again soon for more creative tarot for an inspired life.